uh, Poverty Action Lab, JPAL, is um, he's, he's their associate director of policy, which means he's also in the business of trying to figure out what policymakers want and of trying to, to speak to them about what uh, JPAL research is saying that they should um, take up. Um, Joe uh, is with 3IE. Oh, sorry, I missed Akhtar. So uh, Ak Akramad is uh, chief of party of if IFPRI's program uh, in Bangladesh. The program is called Policy Research and Strategy Support Program. So guess what he spends his uh, days and years doing in Bangladesh, really engaging with policymakers, trying to find out what they would like to know about and then trying to do the research to deliver to them. So there's some experience there. And then Joe is with 3IE, again a commissioner, a user of evidence, um, engaging with policymakers around uh, trying to understand what kinds of evidence they need as well. So uh, the, the questions that I'm, I have, I did send to the panel in advance and the kinds of things that we'll discuss are really in the space of social sector programs uh, with or without a connection to nutrition, how do we go about doing a better job of delivering the kind of research that can actually help um, make programs work. Um, so I'm going to ask Joe and Jasmine to speak first because I sent them somewhat similar questions. Um, what, what I'd like them to speak about is how do they engage with governments around understanding demands for evidence and then go about delivering some of that. Um, if you could specifically speak to um, either the national government in India or state governments within India, I think that would be more meaningful to this audience. But you know, feel free to, to go global if that's what you need to do. So maybe, Joe, you can go first, and then um, Jasmine, you can go after that. Yeah, thanks. And they'll speak for about five minutes or so. I have questions for Akhtar and Nell after that. And then we'll open the floor up to questions that you may have around those issues. Okay, Joe. Thanks very much, Purnima. So um, 3IE works at different levels. We work, like Purnima said, um, we work across the world and with low and middle income countries. And um, of course, our main office is in Delhi and we engage with the government of India, um, not just at the national level, but also at the state levels. Um, quite a few of the impact evaluations that you saw today um, are have been supported by uh, by the International Initiative for Impact Evaluation, so the Double Fortified Salt um, um, study, the, uh, the Sudha was talking about the Narega study, um, if um, Dan didn't make his presentation right, well, on video. No. But if he had, then he would have talked about another study that we'd supported. So essentially it was, um, um, we, we, we support programs that are essentially of um, evaluations that are real world, that are evaluations of real world programs. And that's sort of one of the first conditions that we impose on the kinds of um, evaluations that we support. So they have to be policy relevant. Clearly they have to be extremely rigorous and very well done. And, um, but they have to answer an important and key question. And I think this sort of takes us to the question of uh, what sorts of uh, what sorts of areas should you go into to think about generating new evidence or even doing uh, impact evaluations of the kinds that uh, you've heard of today. And one of the things I was talking to Purnima about was the question of equipoise, really knowing. So clinical equipoise is really saying um, that you should undertake um, clinical trials in areas where there is high uncertainty or where you're completely, where you're agreed as a community that there is um, high uncertainty. And that's one of the first, um, that's one of the other sort of conditions that we have for uh, the sorts of studies that we support, that you have to, it has to be a key and an important knowledge gap for uh, the agency that we're talking to. Uh, so we work um, specifically within India, we work with the Ministry of Rural Development, but then we also work with the governments of Bihar, we work with the government of Kerala, we work um, with the government of Haryana, now Gujarat, Maharashtra, and these are across different programs. So whether it's looking at uh, National Rural Livelihood Mission, that we are talking um, about setting up impact evaluation ready m &E systems, so that it's not just one-off impact evaluations that, um, that we are thinking about, but really getting systemic change so that 
the government can be thinking about rigorous evidence about their programs, and that's at the central level, or thinking about or supporting impact evaluations at the level of state government, so ICDS or IPMS, which is um, a management system to deliver better. These are to deliver nutrition-related or nutrition-sensitive programs in Bihar. These are or Gram Varta, which is also co-supported by the FID, um, or um, nodal Anganwari centers, just so that uh, we can understand as to what sorts of incentives work best to deliver programs. Those are sorts of the kinds of questions we support. And um, I think what becomes important for us is to also ensure that, um, well, just to back up a little bit, impact evaluation, the way we think of it, is not always about evaluation of the long-term impact. And I think one of the comments that, um, that was made by one of the members of the audience was really pertinent. We have to start expanding our own viewpoint about what is required, um, uh, what, can, what can be done through impact evaluation methodologies. And implementation science is, I think, something really important and something that we have been doing, but we don't call it as such. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for example, if you're thinking about how to deliver Narega better, we know that the government of India passed a law in 2006 which said, well, business correspondents can now deliver cash from um, brick and mortars, you know, um, buildings to uh, the to the last mile beneficiary, has it worked? Does it work better than, um, say, um, automated systems? Those are sorts of the implementation and delivery questions that we think are really important and should be supported. So then we also. In, in its earlier incarnation, we worked also with the Independent Evaluation Office, which is now um, gone, gone. <laughs> um, to then think about, well, are these questions that we can um, answer, um, and should we be answering them? One of the other key ways that we engage governments is to point out gaps in data mm -hmm. and gaps in knowledge. So, um, as, and this is not just true for India. So whether we're working with the government of Indonesia or with the government of Rwanda, w I, I think one of the first conversations that we have with them is to say, um, um, look, you're working in the area of poverty alleviation. Do you know, for example, and this is in Indonesia, do you know what is the best method to target your program? And this was a really high quality study that uh, amongst others helped to uh, get the government of Indonesia to think better about how to target their poverty alleviation program. So they traditionally use means testing. And then came along um, uh, this group of researchers that, were, that worked with 3IE as well as with the government to then said, well, let's think about how communities can help to target. The th and so there was a big impact evaluation that was set up. So the, and it had different intervention arms with the very big caveat that 3IE is not just doing um, RCTs. <laughs> and also, um, a large part of our portfolio <laughs> is um, quasi-experimental methods. But in this case, um, it was a big RCT, which looked at means testing, um, community participation, and a mix of the two, and found that actually the efficiency of targeting with means testing is high, but the happiness or the satisfaction level amongst community members is just much higher when you combine it with community level participation. Um, so this has now been adopted by the government there. So just to sort of finish my remarks here, um, and I'm assuming we'll come mm -hmm. back. Yeah. Um, so the sorts of questions that we are thinking about are um, need to be policy relevant real world and uh, should be um, sh should be informed by um, um, by a, either a critical lack of evidence or a huge demand from the policy community. Thank you so much. So I, I want you to hold a question in, in mind, which is you go to them with uh, pointing gaps and trying to engage evidence, engage them around evidence building, or mm -hmm. how do we, do they come versus do, you, do they come to us? So, so Jasmine, similar yep. set of questions to you, especially as you're um, trying to engage governments around evidence from JPAL. Yeah. So thanks, Purnima, for this opportunity. I think um, as the policy team at JPAL South Asia, this is one of the primary goals that we are working towards, which is, um, and, and 
you know, I think keeping, uh, you know, with this topic, I think I'm, I'm going to focus more on how are we, what are the various ways in which we can generate demand for uh, evidence specifically and around uh, nutrition uh, within the governments. I mean, there is a lot of policy relevant research that's happening even outside the government, but I think, uh, you know, uh, especially when governments are committed to generating evidence and participating in the process of generating evidence, even funding uh, evaluations, I think that just gives an extra level of engagement um, that, that uh, you know, we are looking for. So um, I want to go very quickly first on some of the broad remarks made earlier in the day because I find them very pertinent. Um, Dr. Santosh Matthew had talked about the, the short political and bureaucratic cycles, you know, and we know that at the end of the day, in, in, and this is something which, is, which rings true so, uh, so much, you know, in all the conversations we have with many state governments, JPAL, as, our, as, as a policy team at JPAL, we are engaging largely with state governments because we see a lot more, um, you know, diversity of thoughts and, and, and innovations that are being tried out. And what we do see that majority of the time and capacity of, you know, senior secretaries and bureaucrats is still going towards operational issues and firefighting. And, and again, the average time cycle that they are around is, say, maximum a couple of years. So how do you then get the motivation to invest in generating evidence or even participate with evaluation organizations to generate evidence. And on the top of that, of course, the political uh, uh, set of uh, you know, priorities also have to be factored in. Um, so all that eventually, what it means is that actually, the, you know, by the time governments come uh, into power and, and you know, their policy priorities are framed versus the uh, urgency then to act upon them, there are very small policy windows available where people are, or the governments themselves, are willing to pilot innovations, but at the same time test them rigorously. What we see many times is that you approach them at the point when they've already committed to something, and um, you know, uh, as JPAL, we do our cities, so uh, uh, that sort of puts us in a bind. I think also that sometimes if the commitment is of the order that, you know, even the the, the capacity to hear bad news uh, is not there then, and therefore you don't want, you, you won't get into evaluation. So. I think our uh, uh, our priority or, or our attempt uh, increasingly is to identify uh, how can we make uh, a, take advantage of the policy windows when bureaucrats are interested in actually uh, piloting and testing policies. Um, the other thing actually Harold spoke today morning was about you know uh, why is it that you know uh, innovations are not happening say in PDS or or in, and say for example I think he mentioned specifically food fortification uh, actually. You know, we've been talking very, uh, I would say, uh, intensively with several state governments. And Tamil Nadu is one example. I'll come to it in a couple of minutes. But also with Punjab, with, uh, you know, with Haryana, with uh, Maharashtra, and Rajasthan. And we actually find that there are innovations happening. You know, food fortification is one example. Uh, you know, some of these states are actually very seriously considering or already are piloting a f a fortification of either oils or wheat. Uh, in, in that PDS, or salt is already happening in many parts of the country. The general sense that I get that as, as evaluations, uh, evaluation organizations or as researchers, there is a lag. I think policymakers just move quickly from you know, framing the problem and then going to solutions, and uh, they will not, uh, there is no, I would say, uh, they do not have options or many times resources to look at how can I get this tested rigorously. You know, internal capacity for evaluation in governments mm -hmm. or even identify a good evaluation partner is is quite limited. So um, I think there are innovations going on, but um, uh, the the uh, the entire I think crux is around identifying uh, where at, at what point in time do you engage with these governments. And I think eventually all our experience leads to s saying that especially with policymakers and with governments, if we want to work or collaborate with them in generating evidence, then we need to invest in very deep partnerships. We can't be going in and coming out and, and um, you know, expect that we will know what's really happening or what's uh, really um, something that's of interest to them. And at JPAL, the way we have tried doing this is actually engaging in, uh, you know, multiple conversations with, you know, ident we have limited capacity, but we do identify, uh, you know, state governments which are serious about acting on evidence. And fortunately, with the, as large as we are in India, there are many state governments who are keen, provided you have the uh, uh, patience to engage with them. And, um, and, and then invest in you know, capacity to then respond to the kind of priorities they throw up. So um, I'll give the example, uh, in, uh, in fact, I'll give one example of the work we're doing in Tamil Nadu, but other institutional response at JPAL that we, uh, you know, that we have taken is 
launch a government partnerships initiative. And this is something that has uh, been launched at JPAL Global at mm -hmm. MIT, but uh, through which uh, you know, all JPAL offices can actually uh, you know, pull resources to work more systematically with governments and, and invest in, in capacity in state capitals, et cetera. Um, now, coming to uh, Tamil Nadu, that's, I think, one uh, example of how we have tried to systematically engage with governments to you know, see how, over a period of time, not only we generate evidence, but then get this evidence back into policy design. And uh, this is something, you know, the, the, the initiation for this was, again, uh, you know, a, a champion. I think uh, we always look for a Santosh Matthew wherever <laughs> we are. And uh, unfortunately, that's how many big engagements do get started. But uh, our attempt here was to then come up with a, 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 a structure of how do we institutionalize uh, evidence-based policymaking in a state government that goes beyond a particular individual. And we have uh, uh, you know, tried to do that in Tamil Nadu, where we have a s couple of committees, uh, a steering committee headed by a chief secretary, which considers new ideas for impact evaluation. Um, and then uh, there is another committee that takes periodic reviews of what's happening to past evaluations that have been started and how can we integrate what we are learning into policy. Um, and typically, and, and in health especially, in fact, we have had a large success. We are doing four studies, impact evaluations on various aspects. One of the things which uh, my colleague Shubhra Mittal presented today was uh, on, on uh, seeing how the weekly iron and folic acid program is is being done, and if you'd have noted, that was not an RCT. And I think that brings me to the one final point that I wanted to make, which is, yes, when you want to engage with government systematically in generating evidence, you have to be a little flexible. And for us, what that means is that uh, many times, in any case, I think, uh, you know, we've done this many times, uh, that before we get into an RCT, it's very important to understand what's really happening, understand the contextual, uh, challenges or, or, or what's had, what has happened in the past and really to be able to understand what are the most promising solutions or what the challenges are. And that is where we, we sometimes take up these, you know, either needs assessment or scoping studies um, in, in a, over a longer time frame than uh, otherwise. And uh, that's something um, that we have done in many cases when we are asked a question, tell us how we are doing with this scheme, which is already going on and therefore you can't then do a rigorous evaluation. But um, there has been appetite actually to then hear new ideas because we've been engaging with the governments to hear new ideas and, and uh, do more rigorous evaluations over a longer uh, time, uh, time frame. And I think one question you had posed is um, if you're interacting with uh, SGPAL, if you're interacting with governments and if they are not, uh, you know, something that can be studied through an RCT, what next? I think we are very uh, uh, open in recommending that you, if you know, this is something if it's serious enough, and if this is going to inform your some decision, then you should get it evaluated. We are not the only ones around. In fact, Tamil Nadu has very recently constituted a panel of evaluation firms. <laughs> they did a national search, you know, put out a tender, and I think many organizations have applied. And the idea is to say that you know, we, depending on our, our question at hand, we would like to you know use a range of approaches and. Um, I think that's a great step. I don't know if other states have uh, a systematic way to engage, uh, but I think um, these are some, some of our experiences and I'm happy to respond uh, some follow-up questions. That, that's a fantastic uh, overview. So I want to move now to, to Akhtar because I, I think you've been uh, engaged in, some very sim in a very similar, uh, pretty substantial enterprise with the government of Bangladesh. Um, so I wonder if you could speak to the general receptivity to, to evidence, how that's come about, um, and how you have you know, responded or created demand for evidence. Uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Thanks. Thanks, Purnima. Um, I would like to uh, give three evidences from early 1990s and around early 2000 and uh, very recently. Uh, now, in general, uh, I have worked in several countries, but what I have seen that in Bangladesh, uh, successive governments, they take uh, research-based uh, findings very seriously, and then they either reform the programs or abolish the programs and start new program. So, so this is one example that I want to show from our IPRI's work in early 1990s, uh, there was a program called Rural Rationing, Polly Rationing, you know, it was a national uh, program in rural areas. It's a, it was a rice subsidy program. So that program was uh, running for about five years and then 
you know, there are reports in newspapers that program, you know, a lot of corruption and all those things, leakages. So we evaluated that program at the request of USAID at that time. Our project was funded by USAID. So we found that leakage in that rural rationing program was 70%. And uh, because of that, to transfer $1 of income to an eligible beneficiary was $6. So highly inefficient and uh, you know, uh, 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 not performing well at all. So when we um, presented these results to the government, the government abolished that program. After, just after three months of uh, providing the results. And, but that was the biggest safety net program, food-based safety, safety net program. And uh, government's public distribution system, like in I India, this uh, rationing program, th th that one, was the major uh, outlet of that PDS. So uh, food stock was piling up in the government go-downs. So the government asked us to design an alternative program, alternative to rural rationing. So we came up with an idea of food for education program. Food for education program is not really uh, a school feeding program. Food for education program is a conditional food transfer program. So families, poor families, this is a targeted program, poor families who send their children to school, they uh, uh, you know, got 20 kilograms of rice or wheat per month. And they have to, you know, attend like 80% of the classes, and you know there are some conditionalities. So that program, uh, we, uh, I mean, the government implemented it on a pilot basis. We evaluated the program after uh, one year, and we found that uh, big uh, success of the program. Enrollment rate increased by 30%, and you know, particularly girls' enrollment rate increased because for the same ration amount, girls' enrollment increase because you know low uh, i mean girls uh, opportunity cost lower opportunity cost for attending school so so all these uh, you know uh, findings then uh, prompted the government to expand that make that program a national program so food for education program is started that is that is the first uh, you know program of that kind uh, globally and then after that wfp and many other uh, world bank also you know they uh, 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 sort of in, introduced in several African countries, and uh, so so that was uh, something that the government did based on research results. In around mid uh, early 19 uh, uh, no 2000 early 2000, the uh, government asked us to study four large safety net programs, cash and food based safety net programs. And uh, so again, from those studies, we found that, oh, that was to you know, measure leakages. By the way, these studies that I'm talking about, these are not impact evaluation. These are operational research that we did, process evaluation. And these are more powerful, I think, <laughs> to convince government than impact evaluation. I mean, from our experience in Bangladesh, at least. So, so that was another process evaluation we did, uh, looking at mistargeting and leakage. And then also government you know, uh, took measures. Actually, we had 12 recommendations. All 12 recommendations were implemented by the government to you know, correct this. There may have been an after effect there, but. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, uh, the thing is, if you engage the government, the implementing agencies of the government from the design stage. So they know that what researchers are doing, they you know, also contribute to design, uh, and so, sometimes those are very good uh, recommendations. And then uh, throughout the research, they see what we are doing. And then you know, that kind of you know, builds an ownership of the research. So I think that is very important for the government to, you know, understand uh, the research and then they know and then they know that this is going to work so they implement so i think that is one lesson that we learned uh, in bangladesh and then um, another another program uh, is, is a, a secondary girls uh, stipend program it's a conditional cash transfer program for the secondary girls 
uh, Harold has been involved in uh, with that program, designing that program for uh, you know, uh, in the early stage of that program. So we uh, did uh, another process evaluation of that and also uh, some impact uh, and particularly looking at targeting and so we found that uh, well that program was really uh, very good in increasing girls enrollment but it was not well targeted it was not supposed to be targeted also it was in a universal program uh, so, but then we uh, came up with uh, some recommendations and two of them were implemented by the government one is to target that program and also include include boys in that program because you know we found that boys were not getting the incentive and then you know they are dropping out and all those things and just uh, the last example this is uh, quite interesting uh, and Purnima is involved in that this, I'm talking about angel program this is uh, you know from our studies we found that uh, uh, this BCC, BCC really works, uh, the, the results that we presented, and also Alive and Thrive, you know, BCC works. And also, from another study, we uh, found that women's empowerment is also very important for nutrition improvement. And this is, uh, women's empowerment we measured, we, you know, we, if we developed with Oxford University, uh, it's called WIA, Women's Empowerment in Agriculture Index. So when we use this uh, empowerment scores, we find that uh, you know it has a positive, strong rel relationship with uh, 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 dietary diversity, uh, household level dietary diversity, and also child di dietary diversity. Not only that, women's empowerment was also a determinant of agriculture diversity. So all these results we presented to, to the minister of agriculture. She is very you know, reform-oriented minister. Her name is Matia Chaudhary. So she said that, okay, yeah, these are very good. We are uh, in Ministry of Agriculture, but there is no linkage, actually, with uh, nutrition. You know, our programs, we, we don't think about nutrition. So then we gave uh, her uh, a design how to link nutrition, uh, agriculture to nutrition through uh, gender sensitization and she said that okay we will implement it but not by not through NGOs because if NGOs they Im I implement it could be you know good uh, implementation but it won't be very large we Ministry, Ministry of Agriculture we want to implement this and this is a RCT with five arms and I think this is probably the first Ministry of Agriculture that implements an R our city with its uh, extension agents all over the country. So, so this is uh, very encouraging. I mean, just uh, last week, the government has finally approved this uh, uh, experiment. And now we have started uh, this uh, work in, in 16 districts as a on a pilot basis. The idea is, based on this study, then the Ministry of Agriculture will develop a national program. And you know, as the minister said, only when the government takes up a program, then only you can have you can you can expect uh, you know a scale up uh, impact. I'm I'm worried about if we have negative impacts, but <laughs> 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 anyway. But yeah, these are some of the. Thank yeah, thank impacts. you. Those those were fantastic examples. I think they again exemplify long engagements, uh, diversity of the kinds of research that help to bring government to the table around uh, moving towards bigger impact evaluation. So thank you for that set of examples. So Nell, let me come to you to uh, again as a user and a commissioner, funder of evidence, if you could speak from, from that perspective. And then we'll open it up for some questions. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so just to um, reflect a little bit on today's discussions um, and to speak a little bit from a bilateral agencies perspective. I mean, I guess my job to expand on the title of the seminar would be, as a public servant uh, for the UK government, is, is to think about what are the best outcomes for c citizens and 
maximizing value for money for taxpayers. I mean, in a sense, that's my job. Uh, looking for benefits in public spend, how much things cost, how much benefit, and how to distribute those, those benefits if I'm using public money in collaboration with other partners. And that would be my job if I was in the UK or India or any country. That job is complicated by the fact that I'm working for a foreign agency in India <laughs> at the moment, where actually one of the big challenges is the role of um, foreign agencies vis-a-vis -vis domestic mm -hmm. interests. And I think that's a really important question right now when a majority of the funding for research and evaluation probably comes from external yeah. sources. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge challenge. Yeah. And I don't want to go into all the challenges too much, but we need to think about the supply side, of which this funding question is one, and also the demand side. And there's a big failure across the two. And there are failures on both sides in terms of the way in which uh, supply side is generating research and the way in which the demand side is demanding it, using it. We've heard lots of wonderful examples today. Um, Santosh's description of um, the fact that, you know, we need to find this political market, this electoral market for our research findings, where, you know, most researchers are not good at identifying that. As somebody else said, Suta said, that it's, it's a conservative community. It's actually quite often a narrow community that doesn't really necessarily go into the ins and outs of the political economy in, in, in which it's working. The whole issue around breadth of the space in which we're researching uh, and, and the difficulty of, of answering broad questions versus narrow specific questions, which are probably easier to answer, but maybe not very useful for the... For the um, the person who's spending the money. And I, and I uh, as a consumer of research, as a commissioner, I'm also a broker and a communicator for research very much with the, uh, our key clients, if you like, mainly government partners, but not only. And I have, end I'm often bridging the two communities, the user and the supplier. And it's a very difficult, um, you can see how difficult the relationship is and you can also see how um, I get frustrated with the research community because the questions they're answering aren't the questions the policymakers have. The, uh, the information they're providing isn't necessarily what the policymaker wants. It's not expedient, immediate, quick to act. It doesn't really help um, a policymaker analyze um, what's already happening at the state level. You know, the Mamata evaluation which we funded for the Odisha government, it was challenging to think about a design when it was already statewide <laughs> and actually come up with a, a comparison in terms of um, intervention groups. It, it, it's, it's, so I'm not going to go into those challenges anymore. I think we're, we're pretty well aware of them and they've come through very strongly. We're also, I think, as a community of users and suppliers, pretty well aware of what works in terms of um, uh, in, in terms of what do we know about what helps research uptake and use? Um, but even so, there's a, there's a global industry now on, on research utilization. I'm going to talk a little bit about the UK model, just because I think it's interesting to think about another country's approach to this, um, and then a little bit more about, about uh, DFID. So um, in the UK, we have a cross-collaborative called the Research Utilization Research Unit, which is funded by the Education, Social and Research Council purely to look at the science of research utilization. Quite big money goes into it. We also have a new initiative from the last government, which will continue with our current government, which is called the What Works Network. And it builds on the long experience of the National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence, NICE, um, which is well known globally in the way it uses evidence uh, independently to make decisions around uh, spending public money. So this is a new network that adds to the NICE, which is working in health and social care. Um, and it's a, a set of centers looking at crime, aging, education, economic growth, for starters. And it's a, uh, they're part government funded, part independent funding. They're not doing loads of independent research. They're there to look at the aggregate base of information data, evidence, 
they're there to look at some, um, some commissioning, but they're really putting evidence at the heart of policy making, as, as our government says. They're close to government, but they're independent. And as the, literature, as the uh, blurb says, they avoid policy-based evidence. <laughs> they're trying to turn it around. And, I, and some of them are charities, some of them are academic groups, some of them are arm's length bodies, like NICES, has a slightly closer relation to government. And uh, uh, the UK likes to think of them as the world's first network of what works centres. I'm not entirely sure that's true, but I think it's quite an interesting model um, in, in terms of what the government is setting up to help it make um, evidence-based decisions in, in spending public money. And I think it separates the researchers from the communicators, the brokers. And I think that's actually quite helpful uh, in, in terms of, coming back to your question, Pernamu, about what could help aggregate and think about resolving and prioritizing some of these questions, identifying the gaps, that kind of question. I realize the Office of Evaluation, somebody smiled when it was mentioned, um, was, was died a death with this government. But I also think that at state level, governments I'm finding, the government departments I'm working with, are extremely interested in evidence and results. There's a big focus on value for money uh, for their citizens. I'm, see, I'm hearing it more and more. So that's, that's quite uh, exciting. Um, we also have another alliance, which I find its name amusing. It's called the Alliance for Useful Evidence. <laughs> <laughs> which is trying to, again, <laughs> broker across academia. Uh, just to come back to DFID, so DFID in line with the wider government, is um, hugely invested in, in uh, building the evidence base and the use of the evidence base in policy and programming. If we were to judge this by acronyms, have you, uh, uh, who knows eye to eye? I'm sure you do. <laughs> yeah. That's a new, yeah, I'm sure you do. So eye to eye is uh, development impact evaluation to development impact. It's another support of DFID to the bank. We also have something called 3DE, which is demand driven evaluations for decisions, which is CHAI, as well as 3IE. We also have TWW, which is testing what works, <laughs> and uh, numerous others. Um, E4A, evidence for action. So DFID is pumping money. I mean, over the last five years, well over $2 billion has gone into research, evaluation, learning. We're still not very good at it. So we had an independent review from our independent commission on aid effectiveness uh, last year, which gave us sadly an amber to red signal on our learning ability. Oops. So although we really pride ourselves on being a learning research union organization, we're not that good at it yet. But we are investing in 3IE, we're investing in these other initiatives and in Transform, which has that objective, um, and in BRAC and other initiatives in um, the organizations in, it, in Bangladesh. So we're, we're really putting, we're putting our money where our mouth is, although I'm still not quite sure our brain's entirely <laughs> engaged in doing it as well as we could, but thank you.